Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome again to the Tuesday edition of this morning study. As we are continuing to look through these documents this week, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his blessing so that we might more clearly understand that which is being presented and that which we need to comprehend at this time in earth's history. Shall we now seek his face in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing us. And we ask, Father, for your forgiveness of our sins. Help us today that we might examine and come to understand your word and that which we need to know. We ask, Father, for your watch care over those that may not be able to be with us. We ask also for your guidance and your direction as we examine these documents. Help us now. Be with us so that your will is done. May your spirit attend us. May your angels watch over us wherever we are. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, where we left off yesterday, we were looking at these points that were being made. And we'd come to this portion that says the interpretive process. In looking over the various presentations in the latest round of annual discussions concerning Daniel 11, I am reminded of a point E.A. Sutherland brings out in his book entitled Living Fountains or Broken Cisterns, page 350. Said a mother, two and two are what? The boy hesitated. Surely you know that two and two are four. Yes, Mama, but I'm trying to remember the process. Process indeed. He then goes on to define the process a little further. One day, Mary was bending over a tablet, writing words on both sides of a straight line, like multiplied numerators and denominators. What are you at now? asked Grandma. Mary asked with pride. I am diagramming. In the name of sense, what is diagramming? It's a mental discipline, Grandma. Miss Cram says, I have a fine mind that needs developing. Look here, Grandma. Now, this is the correct placement of elements. Four score and seven are joined by the word and, a subordinate connective copulative conjunction. It modifies years, the attribute of time. A go is a modal verb of past time. The root of the first clause is, why, that's Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg. I keep it in my work basket and know it by heart. Indeed, well, ours is a simple personal, that's enough. If President Lincoln had been brought up on such stuff, that speech would never have been written. He called a noun a noun and was done with it. And that is the point. Another well-known Adventist scholar in this debate defines his methodology as a linguistic, syntactical, and grammatical analysis of the text. Other scholars are simply impressive words. There is an ever-increasing use of intellectual sounding words in an attempt to pinpoint to precision how each scholar is reacting or is reaching his or her conclusion. In effect, they have created an elite and non-attainable world, complete with its own language, that requires a go-between to dumb it down for the average person. It is this very process that not only renders the average layman unable to comprehend or to contribute, but has also become a snare for our theologians and scholars. They are stuck in an endless process, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, when instead it is our privilege to come to the point where we should let us now hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Second Timothy 3, 7 and Ecclesiastes 12, 13. In this process, they find themselves in the dilemma of Isaiah 29, 11 to 12. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. When they say to us that the prophecy cannot be understood because it is not yet fulfilled, and their interpretation may turn out to be correct, they are in effect telling us that prophecy is still sealed. And for them it most surely is. 
as they have placed themselves in a bewildering maze of interpretive methodologies that prevent them from arriving at a definitive and concise interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel 11 and Revelation 17. <clears throat> if, for instance, someone were to ask 10 different geologists from the different secular universities how a particular rock got there, Instead of getting a united response of which all 10 were agreed, you would invariably get multiple and conflicting answers. This is due to the process they each use to arrive at their studied conclusions, though they all come under the umbrella of the theory of evolution. In a sense, the same has become true within Adventism, concerning in particular the books of Daniel and Revelation, with each individual method or process of interpretation falling under the broad umbrella of historical, grammatical, or higher critical methodologies. In other words, these umbrellas allow for multiple right answers when the reality is, in either case, that none of them are correct. Do we have a thought on what he so far stated here? I mean, I, I get it that he wants to touch on the historical grammatical. He wants to touch on the higher critical. He wants to touch on different hermeneutics. But are these really important for us to understand at this point? But it, is it fair to place all the blame on our leaders or to lay on their shoulders the burden of discovering all the truth for us? Now, in this situation, I would have to say no, but I also find it interesting, as I have observed over the years, at one point I had a, a comment that I, I heard from a man that I still greatly respect. And as these elders were meeting together to determine whether or not they were going to cast a man out for teaching from the charts, this one elder commented that he relies greatly upon the leaders of the current conference to tell him what the Bible says, because they have the time to study, and he does not. We cannot afford to be thinking that we are not learned. We have the opportunity of being learned for ourselves. In the dark ages, the Bible was chained to a desk written in Latin, the lang a language the common people could not understand, and it was claimed that only the priests and the Pope were capable of interpretation. The only difference now is the language has changed to Greek and Hebrew, another language the common people cannot understand, and the same claim is put forth that it must be interpreted by our scholars and the BRI. In each case, it is the church who claims the right to interpret. Not long ago, a friend of mine was asked to give a defense before a couple of members of the church that he had been attending. The pastor, who I know personally, began asking questions and the responses were given very much in line with the spirit of prophecy and with the Bible. The pastor made the comment to my friend, oh, well, you cannot understand the Bible. To properly understand the Bible, you need an expert in Greek and Hebrew. You have not studied these languages. I have. Therefore, you need my expertise to tell you what the Bible really says. I was not very happy with that response. I was not very happy with the approach that was being given. This can, <clears throat> this can most certainly work both ways. Our scholars claim that they only can understand, but then we allow it to be so. Shame on us. Instead of becoming intelligent as to how to study for ourselves, we just sit in our easy chair and read someone else's book on the subject or opt to sit in the same easy chair and let 3ABN do the digesting for us. We rarely consider the fact that the Holy Spirit is promised to any and to all who diligently and earnestly study to show themselves approved unto God. We as Adventists are a movement based on prophecy. <clears throat> Not only is the existence our, of our church a fulfillment of prophecy, but like Daniel and his three friends, we are also to be the premier interpreter of prophecy. It was Daniel's correct interpretation of prophecy that won from, the king, from King Nebuchadnezzar the statement of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings 
and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Daniel 2, 47. The same should be true with Adventism. And we should ever remember that it was our distinct interpretation of prophecy that set us apart from all other churches on planet Earth. We know how to give the trumpet a certain sound. Really? The church knows how to give the trumpet a certain sound? Or has the church forgotten to give the trumpet its sound? In writing this article, I sincerely hope I'm not seen as blasting away at our leadership, as I recognize that they are far more intelligent thinkers than I. They themselves have acknowledged the need to step back and carefully examine their hermeneutical procedures. It is only an attempt to set a framework that will allow us to see Daniel 11, 31 to 45 through a different perspective. In doing so, we need to bear in mind that there is reason or cause that produced those prevailing and long-established errors in the church. It was no accident that each group was blinded to the correct understanding of their present truth. And the very same dilemma exists in our own Seventh-day Adventist church. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Proverbs 26.2 The cause always produces the effect. Daniel 11, correctly understood, gives us the reason for the chain of events detailed in Revelation 12 through 18. Put in a different way, these verses in Daniel 11 detail the operative principle that will cause America to speak as a dragon. In this article, we have seen that there are two issues that confront us in regard to the correct interpretation of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. One is the effect of popular and long-held errors in the church, and the other is the effects of our methods of interpretation. In the next part of this series, we will take a closer look at the main error that prevents us from correctly understanding Daniel 11. Samson's riddle holds the key that will let us see this error for what it is, and the subject for part two. So, any comments or questions at this point? Okay, all right, this second article, <clears throat> part two, Samson's Riddle. In the opening thesis, <clears throat> the author presents, in this article, we are going to consider the issue of the daily. In Adventism, the interpretation comes down to two views, known generally as the old view and the new view. In dealing with both views of the daily, it is not my purpose necessarily to try and prove or disprove either, though that will come through loud and clear, but it is <clears throat> primarily to set the framework that will allow us to see the prophecy of Daniel 11, 31 to 45 in a different light than the current versions. So in this situation, the comment is being made that he's not trying to sway one way or the other. He just wants to present the fact that the old view of paganism renders the daily a satanic power, and the new view renders Christ's high priestly ministry as a godly power, should automatically let us know that both cannot be right. In other words, they are as antagonistic to each other as it is possible to be. When I first started studying this subject, I heard many presentations that were trying to state that the daily was high Christ's high priestly ministry. Yet, these were coming from people that also seem to think that all of Christ's work was completed at the cross. And therein lies the, lies the principle of this thing, that is to correctly determine whether something is of God or is it of Satan. Just as the daily is interpreted by Adventism to be a, go a godly character, Christ's high priestly ministry. So in contrast, the kings of the north and the south are interpreted to be of a satanic character. Papalism, Islam, atheism, etc. We can see this principle in a different way when the Pharisees tried to ascribe satanic attributes to Christ, ever going so far to say that he was possessed of a devil 
when in reality it was true of themselves, as they claimed that their works were of God. Christ told them in plain language that they were of their father, the devil, because they wanted to kill him. Here we are to see John 8, 40 to 44. In our personal lives, when we lose the ability to distinguish whether a thing is of God or of Satan, that we are in serious peril, and then it becomes impossible to test our experience correctly to see if we are of the truth or in error. Even worse, we can then become sealed in that error. This principle holds true in the realm of prophecy as well. When we ascribe something to God that belongs to Satan, or something to Satan that belongs to God, then we, we have then lost our ability to place the prophecy in its correct context. It is a significant point, and one that should be noted, that from the highest level in Adventism on down, there is no unity on the interpretation of Daniel 11. But when it comes to the new view of the daily, that is the one thing, with it, almost without exception, that all are agreed on. It is also interesting to note that by 1955, there were no known Adventist colleges in America teaching the view that the term daily meant paganism. Any comment on this paragraph? Here is a blanket statement that from the highest level in Adventism on down, that there is no unity on the interpretation of Daniel 11. But when it comes to the new view of the daily, almost without exception, all are agreed on this. Now, this blanket statement would mean that even the evangelists, the Mark Finleys, the Doug Batchelors, the Walter Weiss, would be agreed that the daily is... Christ's ministry in the most holy. Is that what we have seen? And would that then be a correct statement of fact? In order to understand the full scope of the daily, it is essential to understand the reasoning behind it. There are two specific historical events that will help us to do this. In each of these events, something was removed and then was replaced with something else. Samson's riddle gives us the different set of glasses we need in order to see this concept in its true setting. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? Judges 14, 14 to 18. There are two ways to look at this. A real lion attacked Samson as he was walking, and Samson, empowered by the Holy Spirit, was able to defeat and kill the lion. Physically literally killed the lion. Then sometime later, as Samson was walking down the same path, he decided to turn aside and have another look at the now dead lion. As he stands there looking, he realized that there are bees and honey in the body of the lion. His desire for a taste of honey, bring, being greater than his disgust of where it came from, he took the honey, he ate some, gave some to his parents, but didn't tell them where he got it from. This would be the literal sense as it actually happened in history. The other way to look at this account would be as a type. And as such, there are two things that stand out which provide for us the key to understand what this type represents. The first thing to see is that even though the lion was killed and rendered apparently harmless, it only changed forms and became sweet in the form of honey. Put in another way, the lion is removed and replaced by the honey. If you think about that for a moment, Samson should have become part of the lion's body by virtue of having, of being eaten by that lion. Instead, the lion actually becomes part of Samson's body by virtue of him eating the honey. As something is eaten and assimilated, it becomes part of you. The second point to consider is the fact that this honey came out of an unclean animal. So something that has been removed and is replaced with something else. The first thing couldn't get the job done. That is, it was unable to kill Samson, and now is replaced by something much more effective and very subtle. The first thing is attempting to accomplish its purpose by brute force, and the second in, relies instead on strategy. And instead of being destroyed by it, 
it now has the ability to reproduce. By now, we should be able to see where this type is headed. Where else in the Bible can we see this concept of something no longer able to do its job and having to be replaced with something more effective, a changing strategy to counter a changing threat? Here, the reference now is given to Daniel 11.31 and 12.11. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Here again. And from the time that the daily, again the added word has been deleted, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be an thousand and two hundred and ninety days. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Second Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. The whole concept of the daily, be it the old or the new view, is that something replaces something else. In other words, both views show that something was in place, but now has been uprooted and replaced by something different. The old view teaches that paganism was in place as Satan's primary weapon against God's people, but now has been replaced by papalism for the same purpose. The new view teaches that Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary was replaced or usurped by the counterfeit ministry of the papacy. Both views teach that something was replaced by something else, and both views agree that something else is the papacy. The similarities, however, stop there. The question to ask would be, what was it that Satan was responding to that required him to rethink his strategy? In other words, why did he have to remove something and replace it with something else? The answer to this question lies in Hebrew 10, verse 9. So, <clears throat> if we were to look at that, I'm well, sure we, go ahead. I was going to ask about the honey being in the line. Yes. We, we, we uh, equate honey, the sweetest honey, is when we eat God's word, right? Correct. So, would it being on an unclean, unclean animal, would it be like receiving a false word or something other. That'd be an interesting point and a good point. Now, I mean, it would, it would make the honey unclean, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. I mean, I'll give you I'll give you an example. When the children of Israel were being given their commandments and statutes, were they given instructions as to what was clean and what was unclean? Yes, they were. <clears throat> now, in this situation, And we can back this up from scripture. It states that anything that touches an unclean animal, such as a pig, also becomes unclean, right? Yes, sir. So the honey in touching the lion, even though it was not in and of itself unclean, became unclean in coming out of the lion. Would that be logical, and does that make sense? It does. So if that makes sense, then the premise here being stated that Samson, in partaking of the honey from the lion and giving the honey to his parents, was partaking of something that was then unclean. Now, Hebrews 10.9 is in front of us. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy, thy will, O God, He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Here again, we are informed that something is being taken away to be replaced by something else. This happened at the death of Christ on the cross, as the old covenant, expressed in the sacrificial system, was removed that it might be replaced by the new covenant. Hebrews chapters 8 through 10 provide a good context. In the account of Samson and the lion, it is worth noting 
that it was a young lion that came against him. But if the lion represents paganism, you would think that it would have been an old lion since paganism had been around long before. To understand, we have to know the time periods in which these things took place. It was at the death of Christ that the veil was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that the old covenant and its sacrificial system was done away with and now replaced with the new and the better covenant. Even though paganism had been around for many years, it was pagan Rome in particular that came after early Christianity. It isn't just paganism giving way to papalism, but specifically pagan Rome giving way to papal Rome. This is the removal of the fourth kingdom and the setting up of the fifth. Daniel 2, Daniel 7 through 9, and Revelation 12, 13, and 17, 10. Both are of the same Roman element. Both use the state to persecute the church. The first went for the body as it tried to assimilate Christianity into itself. But the second went for the mind and was able instead to adapt itself into Christianity. Here, the recommendation is to see early writings, pages 210, paragraph 2, The Great Apostasy. Our riddle should make more sense now. Out of the eater came forth meat. Out of the strong came forth sweetness. Now he begins to give a premise. Out of the eater, the eater is Satan. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. Now, it's interesting here, because all of the numer numerals here would give a symbolic represent re representation of 158, which we have been addressing as being a symbol of a league, a league in which we should not enter. Came forth meat <clears throat> from God's word, from the Bible, something to eat. You can see this in Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. The fact that it comes from an unclean animal lets us know that this meat or this honey is a false interpretation of God's word. This false interpretation provides the, the deception that comes from the system of the papacy. Out of the strong paganism, a system openly antagonistic and hostile toward Christianity, came for a sweetness, papalism, a system based on paganism and just as antagonistic, but clothed in religious garments, sweet like honey, but out of an unclean animal. In other words, the riddle could be read as such. Out of Satan came forth a false interpretation of God's word, making the way for his substitute. That is, that out of paganism came forth papalism. Any thoughts at this point? By their answer to his riddle, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion, they are acknowledging two things, the exceeding sweetness of honey and the exceptional strength of a lion. The sweetness of honey is a significant thing as it works with both truth and error. Just as God is able to breathe upon us his spirit, which contains light, power, and much love, joy, and peace, so Satan is able to breathe upon us his spirit, which also contains light and much power. Here, the recommendation is to see early writings, pages 55 and 56. In order for Satan to do that, all we have to do is come to the Bible with a careless or irreverent attitude or with a self-sufficient mindset, using a methodology that God is not ordained. The first thing we want to do is to share that light and power with others, whether it is truth from God or error from Satan. So it was that the first thing Samson did was to give some of the honey to his parents, though it came from an unclean animal. This pr principle comes to us from the beginning, as the first thing Eve did was to give fruit to Adam, though it was handed to her from Satan. Again, Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 55 and 56. When she received this fruit from Satan and ate of it, her eyes were opened or enlightened. Okay, just a, a comment here. Please. Hi, everybody. I just got back. So um, so what do you think about this so far? Because um, he's 
dealing with um, this riddle about how he's connecting this to the taking away of the daily, the, to taking the honey out of the lion. Does right. this make sense to anybody? I mean, I just started looking at it. So have you had any discussion about it? To, to recap quickly, we did go back over the fact that even if there is something that is good, that comes in contact with something that is unclean or evil, mm -hmm. that good then can become unclean. Right. So, so if you're taking this honey, this is trying to say that, uh, that there's a doctrine that gets corrupted by contact with this lion? We could place it that way. Okay. I don't know. Now, I know we do some stuff that's pretty out there, <laughs> but but we have sort of a, a way in which this is this is guided, right, you know, through God's word and how we've studied, like our lines and so forth. But just, you know, this cursory reading of this, it seems too contrived for me, but, you know, maybe I haven't given it enough time. Well, I don't know. I don't know what other people think of it. But to say that, you know, uh, came forth sweetness is papalism, out of the strong paganism came forth sweetness, papalism. So, yeah, I'm not sure if I... The point that he was trying to make was that... Yeah. Okay, the point that he was trying to make was that paganism was directly antagonistic to anything of God. Mm -hmm. And came back, you know, very much in the strength of a lion. Mm -hmm. And then he was trying to say that papalism has had more of the overpowering sweetness, trying to get people to agree with it. But right now, they're not looking at the history of, of papal Rome and its reaction to those that did not directly join with them. Yeah, okay. Now, that's to me fine. The question is, in what basis does he have to place this interpretation of this riddle in that context? Like he doesn't have anything to guide him that I, because I'm looking back trying to figure out, he's just, he's just saying about the taking away. So for him, it's just, he he's taking this idea of the daily, the taking away, and he's just comparing the two, right? That's his right. whole basis, right? Um, I haven't read everything here. Um, but he's just saying, well, since you have something taken away and something, I guess, established, right, that he's he's going to then make that comparison. But I don't see I don't see anything to guide him to make that comparison. Unless there's something that I'm missing. Right. Because he doesn't have a line. When when we study judges, we have these lines where we can take everything and we can place where it is. Right. Quite correct. Yeah, which he doesn't have. Now, now we. How did we apply the riddle? Do people remember what we did with the riddle? Would you restate Nothing. that? What? What? How did we understand this riddle when we looked at it? It's been a while. I don't remember. Okay, so so we were relating it to the riddle in our movement, right? Okay. Right. So that that was uh, the basic idea. So we have a riddle, and we already had a riddle. And so we had we we had a way that we could look at this in connection with the lines themselves, right? Which which I don't think uh, you know I don't see that he has that sort of um, you know key. So when we when we dealt with the riddle, we had it dealing with uh, July 18, and we had that because we had the 30 30 30 right symbol which gave us, uh, you know, 525 and 252, which is where July 18th divides. So we had to put a specific place to put that riddle, um, which, which he didn't. And we also, in the line of Samson, we put the riddle um, on De December 25th, 2021 as well, dealing with Colin's pr presentation of the riddle. And then we had Odilio's connected with the wheat harvest later right the seven weeks so so that's that's how we dealt with the riddle itself 
just where it was placed. But maybe there's some way in which we could understand, like what he's applying, we could understand in relationship to what we're doing as an understanding of the 2520. So there might be something about what he's doing that we can look at, but he doesn't, he's not really, he doesn't really have any place to place it is all I'm saying. Okay. So hopefully that was, my questions were helpful for other people. All right. In King Saul's day, when Jonathan tasted of the honey, his eyes were enlightened as well. This honey was of God, but Saul, the leadership, had ordered that no man should eat. Therefore, it was withheld from the common people. On the spiritual level, Paul let us know that it is the eyes of our understanding that are being enlightened. 1 Samuel 14, 17 to 20, Ephesians 1, 17 to 18. Honey is also referenced in connection with prophecy, Revelation 10, 9 to 11. The two things in common with each kind of honey in the Bible are their irresistible sweetness and the corresponding bitter in the belly experience, Revelation 10, 10. One produces the bitter experience of deception, and the other produces the bitter experience of giving an unpopular message to the church. Recommended to see early writings, 232, paragraph 2, and 233, paragraph 1. What is stronger than a lion? Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Christ as a lion roars as well, and roaring is used in connection with prophecy. See Amos 3, 7 and 8. The point to make is that both lions roar or prophesy. When Christ roars, the books of Daniel and Revelation are open to our understanding in their true prophetic context. Revelation 10. When Satan roars, many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish fire of Satan. Special Testimonies 11, 8.1. In looking at either view of the daily, it is necessary to submit them for examination to the book of Revelation. So here, tacitly, he's trying to tie new view and old view into this on the daily. Now, the books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. One is a book sealed, and the other a book opened. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place in the revelation, the lion of the tribe of Judah, has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus is Daniel standing in his place. Manuscript 32, 1896, paragraph 14. Prophecy has been fulfilling line upon line. The more firmly we stand under the banner of the third angel's message, the more clearly shall we understand the prophecy of Daniel. For the revelation is the supplement of Daniel. Manuscript 32, 1896, paragraph 38. Supplement, defined as literally a supply, a hence, an addition to anything by which its, de its defects are supplied and it is made more full and complete. The word is particularly used in addition to a book or a paper. A defect, defined as want or absence of something necessary or useful towards perfection. In the progression of these articles, we will see that Revelation 12, 13 to 14 is the counterpart to Daniel 11, 31, and represents the results of the transition from paganism as a persecuting power to that of papalism. In addition, Revelation 12 and 13 detail the three persecuting powers of paganism, papalism, and the image to the beast, or apostate Protestantism. Any comment so far? All right. The seven kings of Revelation 17 also line up with yeah, this. Sorry point. about that. So, so obviously, we, we know that in Revelation 12 to 13, we have the dragon power and, and papalism. So, I mean, it, it's pretty well understood that we're going to be dealing with that transition, right, in, in those, those chapters. I mean, we, we would understand this already, right? This is not 
but is there something else that he's he's adding to this or that we should note that we didn't know or is that that clear you mean the connection of Daniel 1131 with this portion of Revelation? Yeah, we, we've connected that before, right? There's not anything that he's presenting here that we haven't seen at this point. Okay. Okay, so so I think, you know, he's he's telling us something that we all know. So, you know, I guess who his audience is, maybe they wouldn't see that necessarily. Um, now, why does he focus on... Uh, Revelation 12, 13, and 14, just because it, it mentions the time, times, and then half in verse 14. That I can't answer. Yeah. I mean, because I would say Revelation 12 and 13 show this, but those particular verses are showing what's happening in as far as God's people are concerned, which Daniel 11, verse 31 doesn't address. Okay. Yeah, because it's it's interesting because Revelation 13, you get the first beast, you get the second beast. You don't have the third beast. Well, no, you have Revelation 12, you have the dragon power. Revelation 13, you have the papacy. And then you have, in the second part of Revelation 13, you have the false prophet, right? Okay. So you got the, the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are described there. Now, we can say the dragon is is spiritualism, right? And it is also paganism, right? Which is one of the things that he's been saying, right? So so we sh it should be consistent with what he's saying. Yeah, even in uh, Revelation chapter 12, the, the false prophet is there. In in chapter where? Chapter, uh, chapter 12, it's, uh, it's just the introduction of uh, the United States of America, which is uh, verse 16, 12, 16. Okay. Revelation four sixteen. Twelve sixteen. I, I can't 12, hear it. It's twelve sixteen. Oh, twelve sixteen. Yeah. Where the earth helped the woman. Yes, yes. The earth being uh, the USA. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So you're saying there that you got all of the powers. You have serpent. Uh, now the serpent, of course, is persecuting. And then... The earth helps the woman, so that's the United States, Protestant America, right? Yes, uh, yes, at the beginning. Yeah. Now, yeah, and we know then that that is, uh, but you know, the serpent here isn't 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 the papacy. The serpent is the dragon power, but it shows how the papacy is, still has the characteristics of the dragon power. So the dragon power is just taken on a different form in, in the papal power, right? That's how we would understand it. Okay. Right. Because we're going to see in chapter 13 that the dragon gave this beast, the leopard-like beast, its power seat and great authority, right? So that's all given from paganism to papalism. So that's how you could see that the dragon is still the one persecuting God's people. Because it's going to be near the end. Well, you could say the wilderness, of course, they flee into the wilderness. But the earth helping the woman is particularly a reference to the United States. Okay. So the premise for Revelation 12 and 13, detailing the three persecuting powers of paganism, papalism and the image of the beast, or apostate pro Protestantism, we're saying that we can see this. Mm hmm so his next paragraph, the seven kings of Revelation 17 also line up with this transition in Daniel, showing that there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and one is not yet come. The five kings that are fallen are Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, Fifth, Apel Rome. Understanding the daily is paganism allows us to see the transition between the fourth and the fifth kingdoms. And the one that is the sixth kingdom now in place can be no other than the United States of America as it becomes the next persecutor of God's people. The dragon, paganism, the beast, papalism, and the false prophet. So here in, in a not really a statement, but a fragmented statement at best. He says that the sixth kingdom 
as it becomes the persecutor, is then aligned here with the dragon, the beast, and the fall, and as the false prophet. And he recommends that we see Great Controversy 442, paragraph one. Yeah, which which we're going to, I mean, of course, we've dealt with uh, the United States. Um, that's just going to deal with that issue of the U.S. as apostate Protestant. So where's the, just the statement is here, 442. Um, so just talking about the lamb-like horns and the dragon voice and the symbol pointing to the striking contradiction contradiction between the professions and practice of the nation thus represented. So just showing that that, that two-horned beast is the United States. Now, what we don't see supported in the spirit of prophecy is the interpretation of these seven kings, right? Ellen White's not going to give us this list. Now, we know that the pioneer's understanding, which Uriah Smith promoted in his book on thoughts and revelation, is that the seven heads of all of the three beasts, the seven headed beasts, all represent forms of government, right? Okay. That was Uriah Smith's view, right? So um, now we, we argued that that is true for the first beast, the dragon beast. Then for the leopard like beast, we applied um, these symbols Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, etc. But we didn't apply the riddle to the heads, whether that's right or wrong. We took the position that that the seven kings are not the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 17. So we had, in our understanding of Revelation 17, we looked at it quite differently. That we took that the seven heads, there are seven mountains, that they don't represent kings or kingdoms, right? That is... When we looked at the beasts, we could see that they had some similarities, but they had differences. That is, they have these, what we would call superficial uh, similarity, you know, seven heads, ten horns. But they're quite different creatures, right? The great red dragon is, is very unlike the leopard-like beast, right? The leopard-like beast is not a dragon. You know, it has you know, feet, of, feet of a bear, mouth of a lion, right? And, uh, you know, the body of a leopard. So it's, it's, it has, um, you know, the characteristics of Babylon, Medo, Persia, and Greece. And then, um, but, but we're going to look at it as being papal Rome. It arises from the sea. It, it, the dragon is going to give him his power seat and great authority. So obviously they're not the same beast. And, it's going to have crowns on its horns where the crowns are going to be on the heads of the beast of Revelation 12. So these, I think, are important differences. And, and especially on the 1843 chart, we can see that there, one is the pagan paganism, the other is papalism, right? So when we get to Revelation 17, we now have the papacy is not the beast itself. The papacy is is riding this beast, right? So it's committing fornication with the kingdoms of the earth. So the beast there is, is not the same beast. And then when, but when we look at it and we say, well, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, we take that as a symbol of the city of Rome, that that is talking about the fact that the papacy, by sitting upon these seven hills of Rome, becomes this universal power, seven being a symbol of that. Uh, but it is, it is not, the beast itself is not the papacy in Revelation 17, right? And, and when we look at the 1843 chart, I mean, we, we have this woman sitting upon this beast, and it just says papal Rome. It doesn't really distinguish, you know, what the beast itself is. It just puts it all together as papal Rome. But we know that the woman riding the beast is the papacy. The beast itself. I mean, a person could argue that the woman riding the beast makes up papal Rome, but that's the characteristic of papal Rome, that it's a church controlling the state, 
through the city of Rome. So, so he, he, so within this movement, we have taken this position that the seven heads of all of those beasts are the same heads, that they all represent Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, paper Rome, United States, and the UN, right? That's the position that this movement has taken. But that is a new view, right? That's not something that was ever understood by the pioneers, right? Correct. Now, it, it is a modification of a view that Roy Allen Anderson really promoted, right? Now, there were people in the time of the Uriah Smith who were promoting similar types of ideas of trying to assign uh, the heads to the kingdoms, but he opposed that, right? And that's because he supported the pioneer view. And, and there was all kinds of different solutions. Roy Allen Anderson is the first one who put, like, that I know that established... Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal. But then he put spiritualism as the sixth and the United States as the seventh. I don't know if people are familiar with that. And that's the view that most commonly exists within Adventism today. When we switched the last two around and have the United States, well, that makes much more sense as far as the kingdoms are concerned. But we only apply that to the beast of Revelation 13. We don't apply that to the beast of Revelation 17. At least that's in our studies. That's what we had done. So he's going to uh, apply this riddle to these kingdoms. And I don't see that we can do that. But I could be wrong. But that that's my view is that this, this interpretation in Revelation 17 to apply the riddle to the heads which are these then these seven kingdoms, I think is a mistake. But he's so so part of the problem that I have here is that we're supposed to be following Miller's rules. But have we used Miller's rules yet in this study? What has he done? Has he used Miller's rules at all? I don't at this point he's touched on it, but I don't think that the application has been made properly. Right. So what he's done is he's has all kinds of ideas that he's just carried over from other places, but he hasn't examined any of them. He hasn't established anything based upon Miller's rules. He stated things, right? He keeps suggesting ideas, but he doesn't prove them line upon line. Now, he does occasionally refer to other verses and say this is connected to that. But he doesn't show us how it is, right? Exactly. Which is, right? So now, of course, sometimes it takes a lot of, of space to do that, right? It takes time. But I haven't seen him applying yet Miller's rules that he says that he uses. So how can he establish that these kings are these kingdoms, he hasn't, he hasn't shown us that. It's just assumed. So he still brings in all of this assumed knowledge without examining it. And, and he hasn't even really made the argument because it's, it's always been assumed. Okay, the reason why the one is, that's because we're in 1798. Other people have established, tried to establish that. But we took the point that the one is can only be understood at the time when is is. And, and that, that the one is, is Biden. So we take these, these uh, seven kings are the presidents of the United States. And the one that is, is the one that is when this was understood, which was Biden, which is still now. So the one that is, is. And then there's going to be a seventh. And, and it's going to be a short time that, that you have the seventh. And then we have the eighth. And... And, and I'm arguing, because we didn't really go into this in detail, that just like we have the seven um, uh, kings of Medo-Persia, that's not all the kings of Medo-Persia, right? Like these, of course, are going to be the first seven kings of Medo-Persia. And we're saying we can line up those kings of Medo-Persia with presidents of the United States. But it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be more presidents of the United States after seven. It's just that the eighth, which is the papacy, is going to show up 
And so the riddle, I think, applies specifically to the time that we're living in. That's when we understand this riddle. And so there could still be more presidents of the United States, just as there was more uh, kings of Persia after Artaxerxes. But it, it, it has to do with the point in which that prophecy is bringing us to that matters. So this is something we, we you know, we, we still haven't, you know, all resolved. We don't have it all resolved. But, but that's our position, at least at this time, is that these seven kings are not the seven kingdoms. Okay. It's very interesting to note that Uriah Smith in his book, Daniel and Revelation, changed two words into seemingly different prophecies, one in Daniel and the other in Revelation. The first one had to do with the identity of the king of Daniel 1136, and the second had to do with the identity of the seven kings of Revelation 1710. The claim is made that these two prophecies are directly connected to each other, and though he did not recognize the connection, he found that if he changed a word in one, he must necessarily change the word in the other. <clears throat> Here he gives the references as to where this may be found in Smith's writing. Yeah, so we discussed about this before because we did read that where he's going to deal with it later. Right. But I still don't see how those two are connected. He's not He's not establishing a connection. Right. But he's saying if he changed one in the one, he has to change it in the other, which I don't see even with what he's presented so far. I don't see how. Right how they're connected right you don't see it either i have not seen it no okay so maybe he's going to try to explain it further but in looking at the current prevailing views of daniel eleven thirty one to 45 in adventism and abroad it can be seen that they have one thing in common that almost all are united on the new view of the daily okay this has been stated now multiple times at least once before, just in this article. But I'm not seeing how that has an interrelation to the king of Daniel 11.36 or the seven kings of Revelation 17.10. Right. So this is his main his main argument, is that these are all connected. Right. And that the, having the correct view of the daily is essential to understanding this. And then it somehow... By changing verse 36. But see, we know you not, Uriah Smith had the correct view of the daily. Right. Changing the word in verse 36 didn't affect his view of the daily. And the other word that he's going to deal with is where it talks about these and there. Or, right? Okay. There are five kings or these, these, these are, or, yeah, these are seven kings or there are seven kings. Again, that doesn't, I don't see the connection of how that relates at all. Now, I know you've gone through these articles already, right, Dwight? I've gone through a lot of them, yes. Yeah, so so you couldn't see what he's trying to say at all? Not at all. Okay, which I can't see it at all. Okay. The it, It's a very cursory view, and it's not, it, it's not giving the point. It's not establishing the premise. Mm -hmm. Now, you know... <sighs> When I, when I look at how people write, you, you know, it, it sort of tells me a little bit of their thinking processes, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how people communicate, which is why I can always tell when a woman is writing, which some women are offended by it, that I can tell when it's a woman writing. But women write differently than men, and and different people write differently. So I'm I spend a lot of time analyzing how people write, how they communicate, how they put their sentences together, right. what kind of things, details they notice. So he says a lot of things, but he doesn't say much, right? He, he, what he's been doing in all the articles that I've looked at is he, he tells us what things that we already know. He reminds us of things we know. And then he tells us his conclusions, but he doesn't show the steps. Right. right? He, he doesn't logically go through and say, here's my premises. And if this is true and this is true, then this must be true. He hasn't done that. And, and, and even when he does his conclusions, they're not really conclusions. Well, 
part of part of the issue that I'm seeing with this. Yeah. At the at the beginning of this article, he gives us reference to uh, E. A. Sutherland's book, and he quotes from it on a point of a boy and a girl both trying to understand one math and the other verbiage. And yeah. both are being told by their teachers to show their work and show their steps. Mm -hmm. Here, the assumption is made, but the steps are not, to prove the assumption, to prove the premise, are not being presented. Mm -hmm. it, which is a really common thing that I find with people, is that people... and. and, and now you could say, you know, people do it intentionally. I don't think they do. But it's like, you know, people who, you know, for, for instance, who present, well, here we're going to follow these rules, then they don't do it, right? Correct. I've seen this happen so many times. Uh, a good example was in, uh, in 2018 in Arkansas. Uh, Parminder did this, this presentation about the fact that uh, we're not studying like we used to, we're just waiting for the person to tell us everything uh, because, you know, we figure since they're the teacher, they have authority. But we used to kind of study together in a more cooperative way. Right. And sort of bemoaning the fact that we weren't doing that anymore. But then, of course, he wasn't doing it. He was actually being there as an authority that we had to just accept what he was saying. So some people could say that that's sort of. Uh, you know, almost like a camouflage, like you say, you know, like a politician would say, you know, you need to have freedom and democracy and so forth. And yet they're the ones taking away your freedom and, and so forth. Right. So it, it could be some of that, that, that this is a deficiency he has himself that he's not aware of, but he thinks, you know, he sees it in other people or something. I don't know, but it's, it's just not, he hasn't really presented his argument. He's just, he stated what he thinks and he's brought, let, let, had, had us look at some scriptures, but there isn't a logical flow. And so there's something in, in the way that he thinks and the way he communicates that's not very precise. You know, I think, you know, it makes sense to him. Just, he just doesn't know how to show it. Right. He, 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 he has a leap in his thinking and he doesn't know the show. Okay. That's, that's, that's what I now, would say. As, as we look at the, the last portion of this article, here in his conclusion, he's saying that throughout Adventism, that almost all are united with the new view of the daily. The one thing that lays the foundation, which affects the rest of the building. This is one thing that lays the foundation which affects the rest of the building. Excuse me. In other words, the Lord was in the slaying of the lion, but it was afterward when Satan, when Samson turned aside to look and then ate of the honey that the stage was set for his fall. I believe that in our, in our study of Samson that we saw that he was setting <clears throat> himself up for failure in many different ways, mm -hmm. especially since, as I recall, this uh, slaying of the lion was after he had made the decision that he wanted to marry a Philistine. Mm -hmm. So now he, j he makes the jump and he quotes Daniel 1138. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. When we apply the old view of the daily as paganism to Daniel 11.38, it will allow us to understand the lineage of his fathers. These in turn allows us, will allow us to correctly identify the God whom his fathers knew not. The same is true of the strange God of verse 39. As we progress, we will see how this works, and it will also be seen that the new view of the daily cannot provide those identities for us. As we just addressed, a new premise is being added. A new thesis is being presented in this paper. Mm -hmm. But 
he's using this as, in a conclusion and hasn't supported his prior thesis whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The 300 foxes of Samson put in context with his subjection in the Philistine prison give us the key that we need to understand the underlying cause which has produced the new view of the daily and the resulting confusion over Daniel 11. The 300 foxes had one thing between their tails that resulted <clears throat> in the removal of three things from the Philistines. Shortly afterward, however, Samson in prison is represented as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. These will be the subject of the next couple of articles. So in not proving and not showing the work in the steps to go from and understand the new view and old view of the daily. Mm -hmm. Now jumping into how Samson turning aside while he is on his way to marry the Philistine and eating of the, of the honey as being the stage being set for his fall. And then trying to make this application of Daniel 11.38, words are being presented and conclusions on his point are being offered, but we're not able to see any of the work that he's done to, to establish this. Yeah. You know, and I've read through a bit of this, right? Um, but I, I have a hard time understanding his thinking process. Now, you know, so the answer to that, like, like when we try to communicate something, I mean, we all have limitations on how we communicate and we right. all have limitations on how we understand. So the simplest thing to do is to tell people what you, what you think to, to explain it in detail, the thinking process that you go through. And then, you know, then sort of restate, you know, your conclusion, why, why that makes sense. But I haven't seen his thinking process here, right? He hasn't, he hasn't shown me the steps that he has thought this through. So it's not organized. Now, he keeps telling us that he's going to show us and explain things later. Right. But I find he doesn't, right? Agreed. Right? Because, because when he says, as we progress, we'll see how this works, and we will also be seeing... But we don't see how it works, and we also don't see how the new view of the daily can provide these. He says he's going to do that, but he's not, right? And you've gone through these articles. He doesn't really show us that, what he says he's going to show us. It, you know, it, it's, it's a sad situation, but I found that there are many in self-supporting ministry that write very similar to this that they're, they're going to show you a point and they want you to come back for the next article. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, there's, there's just a lot that was being introduced within this one article that has not had a, a definite way of showing how they are thinking through this, this situation. Yeah. Now, so, so this is a, a problem, right? So the problem that we have is there's something wrong with our education. There's something wrong with the way in which our thinking has been modified. And, you know, and I've puzzled about this since I was young. So this is, um, is that, that people don't think very clearly. Now, I used to always think the problem was with me. So I, I used to think, well, I don't understand what people are saying, so I must not be bright or something. But, you know, I could read old books and I could I could understand what people were writing. But as I got into the newer and newer material, people were they more obfuscated. You know, they, they skirted around the issues like all the time. They they. You know, they avoided actually saying what they were saying. They wanted to, you to think that they're saying something that they're not saying. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, so this way of not being able to communicate is, is like an epidemic. You know, it's it, either there's something like in our thinking that's been distorted by 
Um, you know, uh, I've read a lot of books by Neil Postman, and he deals with with the way that technology has affected throughout history, how people think. Now, he, he's writing before we get to, you know, social media. And I don't think it's just social media that's the problem. I think it happened before with, with television, with movies, with uh, just the media in general on, and how we're educated. But it affects our ability to think clearly. Now, studying the Bible is the best way to learn how to think, right? So Bible study is, is really important if it's done correctly and, and done with others. That is, you study with others, not just on your own, because you have to communicate with other people. And so studying together to come to an understanding where, where everyone can understand what's being said helps, helps us clarify our ability to communicate. But it's also communicating with God because there's a problem with us. Maybe the whole issue really just has to do with are we converted or not? Maybe that's all it is. I, I don't know. But it is, it is a problem that I see all the time that people do sermons, people write articles, people write books, and you have no idea what they're saying, right? Because they don't seem to understand what they're saying. Or they can even run for president and not know what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so what I see here is he has some ideas, but he doesn't know how to express them. And he doesn't know how to think them through so that other people can understand them. And, you know, as a teacher, that's the thing I, I constantly work. I, I realize how deficient I am. Right. I mean, it, it's. You know, when I write my articles, when I teach guitar, anything, I'm always trying to figure out how can I communicate so that somebody can understand things. And and do I understand something? Because if I don't understand it, obviously I can't explain it to anyone. So anyway, it'll be interesting to keep going through these articles to see if we can make sense out of it. Well, we'll take, be taking a look at Article 3 tomorrow. Yeah, well, I won't be here, but... Uh, right. I won't be here tomorrow Thursday. I won't be here the Sunday or the Monday, but I will be here the next Tuesday. So I'm going to miss four of them, but I'm going to try when I get back, I'm going to try to watch them. I'll see how much I can get view them. I might, I might be able to have a chance to watch them uh, even before that. So I'll have, you can watch them on my phone, but I just won't be able to participate. Okay. All right. Any other comments or thoughts right now? Shall we then close with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for helping us and guiding us. We need you, Father. Direct our thoughts and our words. Help us now to be able to see how we need to be able to communicate with others. Show us, Father, that which we should understand. Open our minds so that we might be able to provide words in due season for those with whom we come in contact. Direct our steps today. Show us, Father, where you would have us to be. May your will be done. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.